just what's up everybody um i know all of you so it's good to see you all <laughs> hello i know you're all doing doing well in 2022 uh so um just a few things uh wait january 12th oh whoops okay so i made a mistake did I screw something up? Well, I have January. I just forgot to change the heading on the one below. Yes, exactly. Because I actually oh. had an agenda. See what I'm saying? I do. I'll just delete that, what I had put up there then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there were a few things, and maybe I just get your thoughts on, on these. So of course, welcome back. Um, we have the, I put those, goals back in for 2022 i think a lot of this first couple meetings are going to be just with goal oriented stuff let me share my screen and um we have that elizabeth you know so from the dei audit group we have a, a series of recommendations and some i think we've actually kind of done and some were in progress but some may need some attention um, so one is that community inclusion survey. I think we should probably make it. We have it. It's done. I think we yeah, were just kind of waiting. I, I'm not sure if we sorted out the mechanism. Okay. That it was like, I forget what sort Lime survey or something like that that they were going to okay. use. But I think, I mean, essentially it's done and ready. So we should maybe check at that next. Okay. DEI. Can we let's make that kind of a priority? I'd love to get yeah. that out and just yeah. kind of, you know, agree feedback. And we can, I mean, I was thinking like we could send it out next week sometime and just we could leave it open for like two months, just yeah. encouraging people to continue to. It's not like we need the survey results for like a paper, right? We're, we're trying to do it to understand how people are feeling included in the project. And so, I mean, honestly, maybe we could just kind of keep it per perpetually open if we can, if we can see, I don't know, something like that. I just, we, we can keep it open for a long time is what I think. So Yeah, I think so. And then we can like periodically check the results. Yeah. And just see. If there's new stuff in March, you know, and yeah. like, in that way, we maybe don't have to keep setting it up and we could just send out reminders. Like, don't forget, there's a survey if you want to tell us how you're feeling um yeah yeah well i'd even be like because again this it's not scientific at least to me so like if if matt cantu like filled it out i'm just looking at you matt like you filled it out in january like you're feeling good about inclusivity but then come march you want to fill it out again because you're not you're not feeling so good yeah that's fine with me <laughs> i mean this makes me think we could probably just like every month do a check in on what people are responding and what people are saying about the DEI. Yeah, I think so too. And it's okay. I think it's okay if somebody responds twice, if things have changed, I have no problem with that. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And in fact, like, I think it's probably maybe even better than a, a survey that closes and it's then like we a, have to wait a whole year again. You had your chance. Everybody's yeah. Oh, good. Here comes Justin. We can talk to him about that too. Okay. Good, yeah, actually, yeah, we can maybe get the Lime survey thing done. What's up, Justin? How are you? As you connect, all right, well, as he connects, we can maybe go back to that one. Um, community, these are these are the recommendations, again, from the audit team is what this was. Community handbook process documentation. Do you know, do you, does this ring a bell, Elizabeth? I kind of cut and pasted. I didn't just. Uh, was it like, that's a good question. Was it like how we go about making changes to the handbook or? I don't know. It was uh, the process by which we um, carry out actions in the chaos project and like how we do things. I think the the ambiguity was found in that um, we have like a lot of things that we do that aren't necessarily documented in how we do them. That's what I remember about it. Okay. Hey, Justin. Hey. Hi. Good morning. So we just had someone come. Sorry about that. There was a delay with the audio. Sorry. What's that? Go ahead. No, go ahead. You go. 
I just had, I had, I just had a challenge. Like the audio was slow to connect. I don't know what happened there. That's all. No problem. Um, and I was just going to say, we just had someone new come to the community um, and she was interested in writing and editing documentation. So I showed her the community handbook and she had been already looking through it and um, advised her to, or encouraged her, I should say, to, uh, you know, anything she saw to like open an issue or submit a PR, but she's very, very new. And she was like, I just am really trying to, you know, get my, get my bearings. So, um, but that might be something that we could uh, have some of our newer folks come mm -hmm. in like, hey, read this, tell us what doesn't make sense, tell us, you know, what needs clarified, or if you see something that's missing that you're looking for, like, maybe make it more of a deliberate project, a deliberate effort that we can funnel some of these newcomers in that are looking to contribute and also want to learn about chaos. So that might be helpful. I like that. Could we, what do you, what would you think about like including a senior member of the, or like an experienced member of chaos as well? Like I was just thinking myself, like I would be happy to go through the handbook like just like just start on page one you know what i mean just start yeah. reading it and i read it and i'm like yeah that i know for a fact that that process is not right or right. you know like i would know that and i'm guessing that the newcomers are like i have no idea <laughs> like that right. might be the case that might not be the case i don't want to make a change yes yeah yeah maybe do we need to have like or do you want to do it async or yeah i'd love to do it async if we could. yeah that maybe. makes sense um maybe in the repo you may be in the repo so maybe i'll take an action item on this i've been meaning to do this for a long time because it was really georg and josh yes, correct mm -hmm. yeah who really did a big push on the um on the handbook in the first place and i think a lot of us were kind of cursorily looking at the work that was done and Derek knows what he, I mean, they both know what they're doing. So it's not like there's probably going to be big mistakes in it, but it's like reading a paper after you wrote yeah. a paper. You just, you're like, oh, I could probably say that better. So. Um, re, it's uh, the person uh, that had reached out was Ria Shalna. Mm -hmm. She introduced herself in the newcomer channel as well. Yeah. And she's at the open source program office at um, Hewlett Packard. Yeah, so that'd be okay. If, if you're looking for context around who that person was. Yeah. So whenever you are ready to kind of invite newcomers to help look at that, let me know and I'll spread the word. My thought was we could do it in maybe two phases. Like I'd give it a pass first, just cause I, like I might read something and I'm like, that's correct and move on. And then a newcomer might take a look at it and be like, while it's correct, I have no idea what it means. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I have no idea what this means, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, why don't let's do that maybe in two phases then yeah. so i'll just start going through the handbook it's not very big, I mean it doesn't take terribly long to get through okay okay. Cool um hey justin, we have a question for you. lucky lucky for you sure the um the inclusion survey are we is that ready to go out because we had talked about doing that in 2022. The lime survey remember this whole thing. Yep, and I remember um, I met with Ruth one on one. And I'm pretty sure we 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 updated it from all the feedback that we had. So I think it's it's in a place where it's ready to run. It just okay. needs to have some folks who would not want to help. Uh, I, I think we have to figure out like data access first of all, actually, just in terms of legality and who has access to the results and whether they're anonymized. From okay. there then we could easily start to plug people in with the right access. We could also give people rights to, to help administer things without giving them access to the responses as well. So okay. there are some options here for how we how we want to try to bring people in on this too. Okay, um, so, so the survey itself, like technically it should be ready to go from what it sounds like, like, to distribute. Content wise, yes. Okay. And then the questions remain as to who would have one of two things administrative access to the survey and then data access to the results. Is that correct? Correct. And okay. probably, probably the data results piece first is the tricky okay. one. Okay. Data results first. What are hey, your. I, oh, go ahead. No, go sorry. Ahead. I, I have a question that is related to this. Um, 
what did we decide about doing a DEI council? Because I think that's the group of people that would have access to the data and the responses mm. would be whoever's on that DEI council. I remember Good that conversation a couple, from a couple months back, but I forget where we, we landed with that. I mean, my, my first thought is we have the, as you know, we have the Ford funding for two more years. I mean, we could just, we could rename the audit team, the council. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this is what the group is doing. It's kind of thinking about DEI across chaos, but that may not work. I like that idea a lot. And since we're meeting regularly anyway, and we've already, you know, accomplished quite a lot with that group. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm happy to not see the data myself. I don't care. Is I'm more interested in the recommendations that come from seeing the data, to be honest with you. That's really what I care about a lot. Matt, did you have a comment as well? Yeah, I'm thinking, I don't know how to say this, but we need to be like explicit on who wants to continue on to be part of the council and who would want to onboard under the council, things like that. We probably need to define these processes instead of just doing them. Yeah. Kind of like board membership. Yeah. It's a good point, Matt. Yeah. And probably thinking about like future proofing to just what that um, participation looks like and if other people like can get onboarded with that too, or if it's, I think that would be a good thing to try to try to maybe map out maybe both with this working group and okay. uh, the audit the Ford group yeah okay well in that case honestly then my first reaction as to who can see the data is elizabeth as community manager like i think that's important that you see the data because that's <laughs> i just think it's you're the most sensible I mean, person i i would i would really yeah I, and, and if you know people were uncomfortable with that then i'm kind of like you matt like i i really just want to know basically what the data is alluding to yeah um if there's something you know urgent but um it you know uh, yeah i mean i would i would be happy to be the keeper of that data especially yeah. until like i don't want the survey to wait until we sort out the dei council stuff yeah, um, no. because the survey is important and I really want to get it going. Okay, so let's, we can bring this up with the audit group too, but my yeah. first response is one person and that's Elizabeth. Justin, we also had been talking before you joined um, about keeping the survey open, just like open-ended for, you know, anyone who maybe comes to the project after the survey was sent out originally or people who like Matt said would, may, might be fine right now but in like six months might not be fine and like would we would want to know that sooner than later and not have to have them wait until the survey is open again and then just periodically review the results what do you think about that I think it's a really interesting approach but I might split it up into two different ways um I think the work that we have around like that contact form and getting in touch with someone, is that something that I remember we had talked about that, like having a way to like get to know, like ask someone questions and email or, or chat. We have that. It's, it's, we call it the joining the chaos community form. It's, is that what you're talking about? Yes. It has like all the so, ways involved and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a more informal, uh, a piece. Sorry, I, I got distracted by some background noise. Could you, could you ask the question again one more time for me? Yeah, no, no, um, that's totally fine. Um, we were just thinking like, it might be interesting to keep that inclusion survey open, um, not hmm. just like close it off. And so that way it could be open, just open-ended. Anytime you want to fill that out, you fill that out. So if you come into the community after we've sent it, you don't have to wait another year. Or if you, you know, if your perceptions change or your feelings change, you don't have to wait another year to express them. So we were just curious, you know, maybe what, right. what you thought about that. 
Okay, right. So the two ways. So I think the informal contact form, I think that's a really good way that we could get that data on a rolling basis, just all the time, or maybe even trying to build that type of feedback into that same process. I think that would be better to get the rolling, uh, the rolling feedback all the time. And then for this, at least for this first time, we, we could definitely revisit for other, you know, iterative surveys. But I think for this first one, having a concerted like marketing campaign and really trying to get a drive out for people to fill out these, um, the survey over a time, like a certain time period over a single month, just to get that initial, um, that and initial data pulse. to work with. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense too. Yeah. yeah. That's the other thing. If people know it's open-ended then like, oh, I don't, I don't feel the urgency to really complete oh, I'll that get to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good, that's a great point. Yeah. So maybe our thinking is maybe we shouldn't record this because it's secret, but <laughs> maybe our thinking is that we like long-term plan to leave it open, but like for the initial one, we, we don't make that as well known or something like that. Like we yeah. give a date, but then like, maybe we can, you know, our, our long-term thinking is we will leave it open later than that. I don't know, maybe not. Or we could just say it's and, a long first iteration of the survey. I have a feeling too, once we get that first uh, run of responses and we go through some of this and get some of those insights, we will probably have more other feelings and ideas on this too. So maybe yeah, we can just keep it a little bit open-ended. Great point. Okay, so this is really helpful. Thank you for this conversation. So it sounds like technically the delivery of the survey is ready to go. We'll talk with the audit group, the Ford group on Monday. But the recommendation would be that we do time bound the initial survey, whatever that time box is, and that Elizabeth would be the only person who would have access to the results. And we all have total faith in Elizabeth to kind of draw out what the recurring themes are or what the points of concern are that we should probably address within the chaos community or things that are working really well and we want to continue to highlight that are working in the project. Okay, great. So did I get everything? And, and maybe just one last question too, but have we thought about a goal for what our response number would be? Like how many responses we're shooting for from the community? I haven't given that much thought. Um, we have, it's hard to know. We have on the mailing list, like if I look, I think it's like 150 people. And in Slack, we have 190 something people, you know? Honestly, in this content, a context, um, this is just my opinion, but I think it'd be better to set a goal for effort or hours worked on this than it would be to set a goal for responses because responses can just be so variable. And we, we have no frame of reference here. We, we have a hard time... Um sorting out people who are uh, subscribed to us or connect with us in multiple channels also. So like we have a lot of people on Slack, but we also have a lot of people on the same, you know, the same people that are on the mailing list. So it's challenging for us to kind of nail down what an accurate number of people in our community really is. So that, I think that would make it also challenging. I don't, I don't know, like what would be a good response rate like I don't even know what would be good here 10 percent 50 like 20 50 I don't know the great question Justin I have no idea uh -oh. the reason I ask is because one thing that I've seen knowing that at least with this current approach so we do the survey and then there'll be a huge well I, the variable amount of work that would come after that for you Elizabeth to go through the data and try to abstract it out or, or, or share a some kind of output from that. So I, I was asking about a uh, goal for number of responses because thinking about what will come after, I've seen it before where some people who do these surveys, then you get you know, an abundance of responses or you get way more than maybe you were thinking about and it ends up being a huge amount of work and there's it gets, it gets stuck because it's a lot of work for one person. Um, so I'm just thinking like maybe it would help to set a goal like are we shooting for right? 100 responses or 20 because each of those if it's only one person who's going to be reviewing each of those responses that maybe we want to think about breaking this up or, or finding another person to 
split the responses with. So just kind of thinking out loud is like that might help to frame also some of this like post survey, like then what what do we do? What do we happen? And maybe it would make it a little bit easier if there was like a team or a small team of people to help kind of move that that work forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely does make sense. And honestly, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I, a piece of me is like, well, we can wait and see. And if it's, oh my gosh, we have a hundred responses to this thing and it's going to take me, you know, 20 hours to go through it. Then we can solve that problem when it happens. Um, but I, I don't know that we would get that many. Like, I mean, our, our community, I would say is probably max, what, 250, 300 people max, if I had to guess. Um, and, you know, a lot of those are um, <clears throat> only periodic contributors or episodic contributors. So um, like my feeling right now is that it, I could handle it, but again, you know, until it happens, I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I kind of get where you're coming from now, Justin. So it would be like, at what number, I guess this is a question for you, Elizabeth, at what number would you see in the responses category of like the survey report and say, oh, I need some more help on this? I think, um, like, I would say maybe, maybe 50. Because um, it's not like we're responding to each individual person. It's just looking at the data and reading through any of the comments and then putting it together. So I think 50, what do you, I mean, does that seem reasonable? Yeah. And then I'm with you, like if it's 30 and you're like, whoops, <laughs> Mis misjudge that. Then yeah, <laughs> turns out. <laughs> We're not gonna be like, you said 50, so you right? just keep doing until you hit 50. <laughs> not my problem. You. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, looking back at the questions that we have here in the, the, the Google sheet, I may have to double check the form to see if we had any free response um, like question like at the end, like share anything that you wanted to say. I'd, we Maybe we added that, but looking at the doc here with the questions, it's mostly um, straightforward things. We didn't ask a lot of open-ended questions or no, we asked two. What was Ooh, something yeah. that our communities lack and you wish it didn't? When you first started working with the community, what are some obstacles you encountered? The rest are all either um, like radio button choices or the Likert scale with emojis. So I, I think it would be like, you know, of course, some people are going to do like the bare minimum and some people will do write you an essay. But I, I feel like that it wouldn't be so much where it's like when you have all those open ended questions, that's where things can get a little bit tied up and I think, yeah, in the processing. Yeah. Cool. All right. This is super helpful. Thank you. Um, let's see, moving on, this is still on the list, onboarding office hours and getting started workshops. Are you still doing the office hours in 2022, Elizabeth? I am. Um, I need to change the day because now I have a conflict. Okay. I have those, those all in meetings. So, um, yeah. I'm going to change a day, but I'm not sure yet. So okay. I need to look at my schedule, but yeah, I, I still will do them. Even if nobody shows up, I will show up okay. every time. <laughs> I think it's good. I, I, I was for a while I was like if nobody's coming let's not do them but I think it's nice to always have them just there it's okay um onboarding I think we're starting to talk through this I really like what you were doing yesterday when you reached out to everybody like on the from the last month or so so Justin we had had a bunch of people hey Kafaya we had had a bunch of people hi uh kind of joining the chaos project via slack you know, just kind of saying, hey, I'd like to participate. My name is is so and so. And um, yesterday, Elizabeth reached back out to everybody. I like. I think we should probably do that pretty deliberately every now and then, um, just to make sure people feel welcome. So I really like that. Yeah, I changed the form a little um, because I noticed that a lot of people say they want to join, but they're not really ready to contribute. So if I send them, even if I would send them a task, like, okay, mm -hmm. here's a task, they'd be like, whoa, I don't, I don't know what this is yet. You know, okay. so I added a, a, a question on the form that um, basically asks, like, where are you in your journey? Like, how familiar are you with chaos? It's like mm -hmm. either, yeah, you know, I'm, I don't know them at all. 
or you know, whatever. Okay. And then the next one is if, if they're ready to participate. So um, that will help me guide okay. them as well. Okay, that's cool. Okay. Um, that was great. Okay, I like that a lot. And then do we have getting started workshops? Like sh remember Sean was doing some of these with Augur? We did them over the summer last year, um, the, the North American summer. And um, I have not talked to Sean to see if he wants to do another round of those. Okay. Um, and I have not talked to Venu to see if Grimoire Lab's interested in doing something similar. Okay. Um, but we can certainly put that on the, on the list sometime could, to discuss. Could I give you an action item just to reach out to sure. Venu yep. and Sean? OK. Because I think they actually went pretty well, didn't they? Like she they did, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if I would have to check with Sean to see if any of the participants actually ended up becoming regular contributors. Um, but I think it was really helpful just in general for Sean to kind of streamline that process of getting someone on board and like yeah. have that nailed down. Okay, right on. Cool. All right. Um see a few more things in here building community conversation around DEI I think we're actually having good success in this regard <laughs> so um, we are making changes to the metrics and the metrics template to talk about how a particular metric in a working group that isn't the DEI working group may have an impact on DEI related issues so I think that's a, a really great thing. Obviously, translations are occurring across all metrics as well. So I, I think we're having good success. And I don't know about you, Elizabeth or Matt or Justin or Kavaya, but I every time DEI comes up, no matter where it is in the chaos project, it's it's met with you know good reception generally. So quick question on the Spanish translation. Is that something we want to deliberately push towards or I don't I you don't really have any volunteers, so. No, I agree. Um, and just because, like, the Grimoire Lab team is obviously located in Madrid, but like, we—that's not fair to just say, "Hey, <laughs> you speak Spanish." You just <laughs> do, do this. this real quick. <laughs> yeah. Translate like these real quick. It'll be fine. Um, yeah, I. My thought was we may just want to, like, stop this. You know what I mean? And just really focus on the Chinese translations. And if there is, a, we could say it's Chinese and potentially others and not focus on Spanish. And if somebody else would like to translate the metrics into whatever it might be, Japanese, Portuguese, Hindi, it doesn't matter. Um, that would be great. But you're right. We need a community of people to, to do this. Um, so Justin, we, we have, um, so I had some money, we used some, some dollars earlier to do some early Spanish translations. The problem that we were having is a lot of the metrics are kind of fluid, so they get changed sometimes. So they just get updated, like a sentence gets updated or a you know a, a lot of the dei line gets added like that section in the implementation it was getting a little bit burdensome to track that with a third party that is paid so we, we could pay if there's a reasonable process to get that done that is a possibility but i actually i actually have many of the metrics from about a year ago translated into spanish but i'm in no way comfortable releasing them yeah, I guess I'm just curious about if we've thought about tooling for this before as a way to kind of bridge between community based and like outsourcing. Yeah, um, Shoya in the Chinese community, they were looking at starting to automate some of the process into Chinese and then it would be like a review. So you'd have like a you'd have an automated process that would do bulk translation. And then you would have an individual like go back through that bulk translation and just be like yeah that's a terrible sentence or something like that and so if that's kind of what you're getting at because we could do that just um wanted to mention here that um i just got an email like during the chaos call yesterday the outreach is doing a call for outreachy mentors that's something we could um potentially have as a mentorship program again 
talking about AI tooling uh, for mm -hmm. this kind of thing. It, there just always seems to be a need of, at least working with our, our friends in China, like a, a group of people that is more than a single person who are really interested interested in and dedicated in continuing to help with the translations over time and as they evolve. So that's what we need to do. Yeah, Justin. Yeah, so one thing I've also seen in other communities, especially ones that start to have that wider uh, international coverage is that use of um, localizations is a really important onboarding opportunity for new contributors. Um, especially in non-technical areas. So just to give an example, like Fedora, the Fedora project has a localization group. Mm -hmm. um, and that group has been really effective to bring in a lot of new contributors to the project. But at the same time, um, those many, not all, but many of those contributors um, mostly stayed within a, a localization type of work and or, or did a little bit of other things in their own local like language community. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having a, a community based platform is important for contributions because it can help build community around these things, mm -hmm. but it does come with an added weight of like who's going to review those things, the translations in Fedora, we have um, language leads so someone will be like or, or a group of people will be the uh, Chinese like language um, managers, I, I guess I don't know what the word is in these tools or, or, or Spanish managers. And those are the people who uh, have permissions to go through and review translations, but anybody can join the, the Spanish group, the Spanish localization group and start localizing strings um, in like any of the two tools I just dropped in the chat. Um, that's why I think it maybe could be interesting here if we're wanting to make, still make it easier for like an outside third party to do translations while also still allowing this community participation piece, maybe we could look at things like um, Weblate being the open source version that uh, Fedora, like Fedora project uses this for its localization. You just need to set it up with your repositories to have the, the web GUI all work and people can just use that instead of going to GitHub to do this stuff. And then there's Transifix, which is I think more the industry standard for this kind of stuff, but okay. um, I like open source, so, <laughs> we, so um, no, I just think those would be. Going. Yeah, we well, we had Webly. Now that you bring that up, and to Matt's point earlier, with Outreachy, we had a, a student Tola who had started to. This was years ago, even. It started to explore Webly as a as a the tool for doing these these translations. So maybe we can revisit that again because it, it looked very promising at the time. So thanks for bringing that back up to the top of the list. Hell has still yeah. been going around to the badging meetings too. So okay. Can, I think he's still available if we need his insight on this kind of stuff too. Okay. Um, listening to you talk to and Justin and Elizabeth, you can probably kind of confirm this. I do feel like we're actually developing localization in China. I mean, they are, they're starting to run local Chinese meetups. They're starting to um, do chaos casts in Chinese, so running podcasts with within the Chinese community. So I, I think we're we're getting some some really great traction there. And to your point, like Shoya and Yahui have been like as leads, not necessarily language leads, but like localization leads and translation leads have been completely invaluable when it comes to to doing localization in China. I mean, it's something that. I know I couldn't do, and just just something I couldn't do by myself. So that's cool. So, okay. Um, this maybe could be a conversation, at least on the infrastructure side. Um, maybe this is something we look at the the Ford group. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how infrastructure requests really work. Because I for for chaos or who we would go to for for setting something like this up. This is good. I, I don't have an answer to that, um, but yeah, something I think we could talk about on, on Monday. All right, cool. So thank you. Um, always good ideas that are coming out of this, this meeting. Um, also came 
developing new chaos metrics. These are kind of um, as we just continue on in 2022. Um, I think some of these are lined up with with the badging program. I think others are kind of wrapping up some metrics that have been around for a while. Um, we have that in there twice. Okay. I moved um, it because it's it's kind okay. of its own. Thing. Gotcha. Um, the accessibility audit. This is something that we had started to do. Um, but we just didn't finish really. So this is, do you remember this, Elizabeth? We had actually started to have conversations around. I think Emily was doing it, right? Emily, yeah. And so probably I just need to reach back out to her because she has an organization that does <laughs> accessibility audits. And there, again, there, that's not something that I could necessarily do. Um, so let me reach back out to Emily. Um, yeah, I think that should be kind of like, I really feel strongly about that, that we need yeah. to do that. And we have the funding to do it. So that's a, like, it's not a financial barrier. Um, let's see, I'm gonna skip the next one. Inclusive naming, I think this is, this came up also in the community call a little bit more. Um, Does anybody remember this conversation? It was about how to think about the chaos project itself from an inclusive naming perspective. Yeah, I feel like Lauren was also involved in this, right? She was, and I don't think she's gonna be around. She finished up, so. Okay. We, um, I know from the community call yesterday that we're gonna be focusing starting on the metrics for the inclusive naming. We've added yeah. it to the list of kind of retrospective view on metrics and also the um we're focusing on working on that for the next iteration of metrics as well okay okay that's i think that's a good start once you have some kind of process on this uh on this inclusive naming it's going to be a lot easier to understand how to do it for the rest of the project okay correct me if i'm wrong there cool thank you Matt, do you, Matt C, do you want, um, or are you a part of the inclusive naming initiative group? No, I talked to somebody about it at the last open source summit, and I'm not necessarily sure how to get started with it, to be honest. I can send um, you some information. I'm, I'm just like, I've only attended maybe one or two meetings and I just kind of have mm -hmm. lurked. I haven't participated, but I am in their Slack and stuff. So I honestly, I focus mostly on the stuff that they produce, like the the, the tiered list of, yeah. So um, it, it'd be good to attend a couple of their meetings. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, this is me and I'm already, I'm talking to Kevin about this. With respect to simplifying the website, there's a lot going on. <laughs> before, before we get started on um, the next items in the in the list, yeah, could we maybe deal with this, a set amount of like this is just for my brain and structure, but um, could we maybe do a set amount of like goals every meeting so that we're not just going through a list of goals all meeting? No, that's totally fine. This was just kind of a first meeting thing. Okay. I was just kind of because we hadn't talked about these in a month, and I just kind of wanted to get people located back in the things that are probably on the agenda for 2022. That's that was it. That was all I was doing. That I wouldn't run every meeting. Okay, sounds good. Like this. Um. All right. Onboarding, I think we talked about this already, simplifying the newcomer experience. So we're very conscious of this. Um, this one's a little bit on, on me. So I have a meeting with, I believe, somebody from the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, which is an immensely large organization in the academic computing side. Justin, you're probably familiar with ACM. Um, and so just about how badging, the chaos badging program could work for the events that they have. So they're not necessarily open source events, but just asking um, their events to think about badging. I, we may have some opportunity also with IEEE, I think, 
and how just because they run so many events and and badging in that regard too so i think there are there is opportunity there too um uh, quick right. question I, yeah. about that if would we have to change our badging um criteria or processes if it's not open source do we care we don't really care do we we um so we've always been open to taking uh, the, the badging initiative is centered around open source event kind of structure. We have always been open to taking non open source events. It's just that mostly we've been attracting open source events because that's who we reach out to. So we're, we're definitely welcome to um, making that like those accommodations. Because I feel like that was on the criteria for getting a badge. So we would probably just mm -hmm. skip that question. Okay. Yeah. We, we, I mean, even in the original, it just depends on case to case, but we can always omit, like we've had situations where people have a, an in-person or a hybrid event and they submit as an in-person event and then the family friendliness doesn't necessarily apply, things like that. So uh, just kind of that kind of stuff in mind. That may sound weird at first, but I promise it made a lot of sense when we did it. All right, cool. Thank you. We've kind of done the user feedback and survey. Um, and then just one that's kind of on my mind. So thank, thanks for kind of walking through these with me. But one is the connection with the all in project. You know, I think 2022 is going to be my suspect suspicion is a pretty big year for all in. And all in being a different open source project that is really coming from from github and it's about how to help mentors and students get integrated into open source and what we trying to connect what we know and what we have learned in the chaos project to help um, strengthen what all in can be for others and you know one of the things that i i kind of struggle with is like what what the relationship is between chaos and all in and I think that'll be sorted out so it's just more of a uh, FYI this is going to be I think emerging in 2022 more than it did in 2021 so that's it all right look at all those great things that we have I'm on facilitating that that was a lot <laughs> <laughs> I just want to kind of put these back in front of people that these are the things you know it's it's similar to 2021 I, I think there's some new things that are starting to emerge um but it is it is a lot of things so all right and then matt to your point you know next time i think we can start kind of looking at these in smaller pieces and taking them on <laughs> uh just you know a meeting at a time so I think that was your point, wasn't it? Like not a huge list. <laughs> Let's take a, a segment of this. Yeah, so what I was kind of, what I have in mind um, definitely isn't the only idea here, but um, is to go like kind of rotate through goals. I, like this is the goal of the meeting. Um, and then as we move through these goals, while, while we accomplish them, then we just have less and less to rotate through. Perfect. Kind of like picking pegs out as you move across the pegs. It's kind of that kind of thing. Perfect. And we do use, obviously, as you all know, we use these working groups as um, like working working groups often. Like we do work in them. And so I think it's also fair, like if we, for example, needed to kind of sort out how this was done, we can use working group time to sort that out. Um, okay, great. Well, everybody, it's good to see you. I'm a minute over. So. Matt, I'll see you in nine minutes. Yep, see you later. Top of the uh, top of the hour. Anybody want to hear my goat one last time? <laughs> oh, very cool. I have, I have a screaming goat. <laughs> so, That's uh, such I, a I, random I, thing. Did you get it as a present? Or? Yeah, it's a Christmas thing. And I told <laughs> Elizabeth and Matt that it's sitting here on the desk and I'm afraid I'm going to be fidgeting with it. And like, in the middle of kind of an important meeting, like push it accidentally. <laughs> that looks like an Archie McPhee gift, honestly. <laughs> All right. Until next time, everybody. It's good to see Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Happy New Year, folks. Happy New Year. Yeah, likewise.